What's the truth about Japan's Type 10 tank? Is it really under-armored, or does it actually punch well above its weight class? As Japan moves to meet their massive military rearmament goal to double their defense budget, all eyes are turning to their own homemade Mitsubishi Type 10 main battle tank with its bling bling nano-crystal Japanese steel armor. That actually might help explain why it's the world's second most expensive tank ever produced at $9.8 million per unit. But more expensive isn't more better. Let's just see what Twitter has to say about the fourth generation Japanese tank real quick. Oh, oh no. Oh, I hope this doesn't awaken something in me. Okay, that was a mistake. Let's go to Pinterest. Oh my senpai, no wonder everyone loves this tank so much. The Type 10 is making me blush. So let's analyze the tank's development history, unique capabilities to find out what it tells us about Japan's Japanese defense industry and how it works, and what are Tokyo's geopolitical strategic goals. Fire a high pressure round at the like and subscribe button and let's move out, Hua. I can understand all the skeptics of Japan's Type 10 tank, because historically speaking, the nation's tank capabilities are highlighted as a major weak point for them in World War II. It was during Japan's invasion of China in the 1930s that their forces actually used an early version of the Blitzkrieg lightning mechanized attack with tank-centered doctrine at the Battle of Rihi. Small Japanese Type 89 tanks drove deep through China's second defensive lines before they knew what hit them. And this was before the Germans had ever done a tank-centered blitzkrieg strike. But then, an infantry-focused Japanese general named Hideki Tojo took over and dismantled their tank doctrine, leading to massive battlefield defeats. The Japanese military lack of tanks was also in part due to gasoline and raw resource material shortages that plagued their country at the time. When faced with the choice of investing in aircraft carriers and airplanes, they chose that over investing in tanks. At Japan's peak wartime production, they only created 925 armored fighting vehicles in 1944. By 1945, Japan's total production of tanks had fallen to only 256 units. That's barely any units. All of this is to say we need to keep in mind that Japan's military institutional knowledge, or how experienced their defense industry and squad leaders are within their ranks when it comes to tank warfare, and tactics has been somewhat limited. But now they're aiming to change all of that with the Type 10. You see, in 1990, in the final stages of the Cold War, Tokyo began an attempt to revolutionize their tank warfare, which had fallen behind. Japan adopted the Type 90 main battle tank as a direct counter to the Soviet T-72. But the Type 90 was a much heavier tank than anything Japan had ever previously used. At over 50 tons, the Type 90 was mostly suited to combat in only the northernmost island of Hokkaido and Mount Fuji, which was closest to the Soviet Union, where where one of their biggest threats was at the time. Hokkaido is mountainous and filled with marshes, but there are also large swaths of open plains that the Type 90 can take advantage of. The tank appears in one of my favorite animes called Memory Stink Bomb, about the whole Japanese military called in on one biological weapon of a person who smells really bad. Sure, Japan's constitution was limited by Article 9, so they only have a small defense force technically ever since World War II, and so Japan's tank forces have historically been designed and engineered to defend against invasions from the Soviet Union, China, or North Korea. This means their tank force has never been engineered to be suited for large-scale offensive operations into enemy territory. This will be important later on for the Type 10. But this created a major problem. The Type 90 had very limited mobility in the rest of the Japanese southern Ryukyu Islands, which are tiny and terribly difficult in terrain. Why did these islands suddenly become strategically important? As geopolitics in the West Pacific shifted in the late 90s and early 2000s, and the rivalry with China began to emerge, the importance of protecting the southern islands became more vital. And so, in 2002, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries began development on a project codenamed MBTX, which would eventually become the Japanese Type 10. This new vehicle would add to and replace the 200 Type 74s and 341 Type 90 tanks in Japan's arsenal. Founded in 1884, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is the world's 23rd largest defense contractor. Their old location in Nagasaki was actually the reason that the Allied forces dropped an atomic bomb there. Since it was always assumed that the Japanese tanks would always be fighting on their home turf, their defense forces have had unique requirements 
requirements for their tank designs compared to other Western nations. The first prototype for the new Japanese tank rolled off of Mitsubishi's production line in 2006. The Type 10 has three separate weight loadouts to give the Japanese military more flexibility in how the tank is transported and deployed. The minimum loadout comes in at just 40 tons, which is much easier on Japan's infrastructure and allows the tank to use 84% of their 17,920 total bridges located throughout their country, while most other Western tanks, only 40% of those could use those bridges. Bridges. Now, bridges won't instantly collapse if you exceed their weight limit, but if you're driving over them in non-combat scenarios, it's not worth the risk. At standard combat loadout, the Type 10 weighs 44 tons, while the maximum loadout adds an extra armor modules for a total weight of 48 tons, still far less than the 70-ton M1 Abrams. So the Type 10 aimed to be lighter weight and easily transported throughout the home islands and easy to defend against any possible invasion from China. You might have been impressed by the elephant that can paint, but that's absolutely nothing compared to the Type 10 tank that can write in Japanese characters, which is basically like painting a work of art. Can we appreciate for a second how appropriate it is that America demonstrates their tank capabilities by pulling a sweet donut drifting move with the M1 Abrams, Germany shows off their Leopard tanks with beer, and wait, how does Russia show off their tanks? Weird flex, but all right. Starting in 2008, Japan's military began practical drills, including live fire and electronic networking tests that concluded at the end of 2009. The vehicle uses an advanced hydropneumonic suspension that lets the crew quickly change the height of the vehicle or even lean the vehicle by raising or lowering specific road wheels. By giving the vehicle the ability to adapt its suspension on the fly, the hydropneumonic suspension comes in handy when shooting on slopes like in Japan's mountainous terrain or taking maximum advantage of available cover. Remember, Japan is a country that's geography offers very little defensive depth. And what that means is that the enemy is at your border you can only withdraw for a very limited distance, usually less than 100 miles anywhere in Japan before you're fighting with your back up against the water again. Ukrainian forces had the ability to draw out Russian supply lines for hundreds of miles, but Japan does not have that luxury. By 2010, the Japanese Ministry of Defense had ordered 13 of the new Type 10s be manufactured. Japan is so polite, they even engineered a little carrying version to showcase the tank's capabilities. The Type 10 also packs a major, big punch with its 120 millimeter smoothbore main gun. While the American Abrams and German Leopard 2 use a 120mm gun from the German manufacturer Rheinmetall, Japan's Ministry of Defense opted for a gun from Japan's Steelworks that is shorter than the Rheinmetall offering at 44 calibers instead of the 55 caliber, making it handier in tight terrain. Japan Steelworks was founded in 1907 and is famous for using a process that yields incredibly pure steel. They manufactured the world's largest gun barrel for the World War II battleship Yamamoto and still produce a limited number of Japanese steel swords each year. Normally, a shorter barrel cannon on a tank gives the gun less muzzle velocity and less overall performance. But the Japan Steelworks gun had a secret up its sleeve, being made with advanced alloys that allow it to tolerate high chamber pressures, similar to 120mm designs, allowing for higher velocities for the Japanese tank. The Type 10 muzzle velocity can reach 1780 meters per second and great penetration on enemy armor. For reference, that's higher velocity than M1 Abrams round. Firing this thing looks like you're sending out a full Kamehameha at the enemy. This cannon can withstand up to 640 megapascals of pressure, which if I passed even the most basic of physics classes, I might know what that means. Wait, where did that come from? Get that out of here. I'm trying to concentrate, not simp for Japanese tanks. Japan also introduced their very own brand new 7.8 kilogram, 120 millimeter armor piercing fin stabilized discarding Sabo shell to make use of these higher chamber pressures, basically cramming more gunpowder into the round to make up for the shorter barrel length. Confusingly, the munition is also called the Type 10 as well. This round is too high pressure for other NATO 120 millimeter guns because it would rip those barrels apart because they're not as strong. The DM-53 round weighs more at 8.35 kilograms per projectile with a similar velocity specifically designed to defeat the Russian second generation explosive reactive armor. Performance details of the Type 10 round are still a closely guarded secret of Japan's Ministry of Defense, but the round is estimated to give similar anti-armor performance as the M1 Abrams. The tank uses a fast loader similar in concept to the French Leclerc 
which means that the Type 10 can fire quickly and accurately, achieving only five centimeters of deviation at 1,000 meters. A coaxial 7.62 millimeter Type 74 machine gun and 50 cal are also on the tank's turret, and it allows you the option to go Super Saiyan if you ever want to open up with all the weapons at the same time. The autoloader system can carry 14 rounds already loaded up, which is less than the T-72's 22 rounds that are in the tray. But this doesn't concern me because the tank is designed with the defense of the Japanese islands in mind. So we know that they'll be close to the S-4 resupply at all times. Their positions will be right next to ammo resupply, unlike how an offensive army would have to deal with. The main gun can fire faster than the old Type 90, with one shot out every 3.5 seconds. There are two rounds behind the gunner, and six more are ready in the ammo storage compartment next to the driver up front. Having the ammo in the front of the hole can be risky business and can potentially be a downside for the vehicle. This gives them a total of 36 total rounds, which is less than the 45 total rounds on the T-72. TanksEcyclopedia.com Mark Nash wrote a great article and section about why Japan is building their own indigenous tank when it seems to go against conventional wisdom to spend that much money when it'd be much cheaper to just buy and import a foreign tank. But in fact, it often makes more sense to invest in high-end products like tanks for a country because it increases your local labor force because that money is invested straight back into creating jobs. You end up paying your own companies like the Japanese Steelworks and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. Mark Nash goes on to point out that the money is then taxed, so the government recoups some of that cost as well. There's also the plus side of having a secure supply chain not dependent on foreign powers, which could cut off your supply of parts during wartime. And so production continues at a steady rate by spring of 2020, they were able to create a total of between 76 and 106 of the Type 10 tanks. The Japanese Ministry of Defense were also early adopters of advanced C4 systems, meaning command, control, communication, computing, and intelligence. So the new tanks would have ample turret space to accommodate the various displays, computers, radios, and imagers, like the thermal imaging systems, that these new tanks require. When the design was formally adopted in 2012, it was using an advanced C4 technology already. This was meant to enhance the lethality of the Type 10 tank, as well as increase its interoperability with other combat arms like infantry and artillery. Basically, the idea is you could share information between tank companies in order to mass fire on one target and improve cooperation with infantry on the ground. For a country that has rarely used main battle tanks before, they're quickly catching up with doctrine and tactics in combined operations. Each tank's position and status is uploaded to the unit's command network, while an advanced auto enemy search function automatically identifies targets in view using an uploaded database of enemy vehicle types. The computer in each tank can detect and track up to eight targets simultaneously and send the data to the platoon leader, increasing the unit's situational awareness. This is integrated command and control function that assigns targets to individual tanks in the platoon so no two tanks engage the same target by accident or even send the unit's collective data to the core level. At 44 tons, the Type 10 could be expected to counter vehicles like the T-90 and the Chinese Type 99 that are much heavier than itself. Composite armor makes up a great proportion of the Type 10's weight. Underneath the composite armor blocks is a unique steel that Japanese Steelworks advertises as nano crystal steel, which is supposed to offer more protection per pound than traditional tank armor steel. Open source intelligence indicates that this armor is three times harder than normal steel. Criticism against the tank's protection include the fact that it appears to have limited side armor, but that could just be what's shown on demonstration models and not the design that your tank will go to war and fight in. Japan made this tank knowing that it would be used in defensive tactics only, and so their vehicles will be in strategic static positions behind berms and static cover positions. The flanks of the Type 10 will likely never be exposed in combat because the vehicles will never perform offensive maneuvers across large sections of open land. In the defense of Japanese islands, they will be driven to beaches and dug in. But to help with the armor, the weight of the turret has increased to 1,940 kilograms, and they've increased the hull as well to 2,680 kilograms. The Japanese Ministry of Defense ran tests of the resilience of the tank by firing armor-piercing tank rounds from 250 meters distance, and reportedly the composite armor achieved the required performance. Altogether, the Type 10 offered better frontal protection in Japanese tests than the heavier Type 90. Laser warning receivers on all four corners of the turret provide additional warning to the crew that the tank is being targeted, but there is limited information on current plans to add active protection systems to the vehicle that could directly counter RPGs and ATGs 
GMs. With many of the protection systems and details of the Type 10 still classified, it's tough to tell exactly how well the tank can stand up to the latest battlefield threats like drones, top attack munitions, and heavy tandem charge RPGs. But one way to avoid missiles is through mobility, and the 1200 horsepower V8 diesel that the Type 10 has can send that speed demon up to 70 kilometers per hour, and has a continuous variable transmission that lets it move in reverse just as fast that gives it a high 27 horsepower to ton ratio. This quick reverse speed is much greater advantage in tank combat than you might think, as it makes it very effective at shoot and scoot tactics, where the tank drives up to a shooting position, fires, and reverses out of there before they're able to get return fire minimizing the time that the tank is exposed to the enemy. The faster the reverse speed, the more effective these tanks' tactics will be. A 2022 video shows tests of a hard kill system showing potential mounting points for the Type 10. It could be that Japan is counting on these systems when it matures to provide 360 degree protection from RPGs and ATGMs without adding on extra heavy armor that would dramatically increase the vehicle's weight. But I want to know what do you think of the Type 10 tank? Did I miss anything in my analysis? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, over and out.